state records of South Australia since 1997 and is currently the content services librarian there, implementing enhanced access to pictorial collections via social media. Jenny is also a professional member of the Australian Society of Archivists and she represents the State Library of South Australia on the National Archives of Australia Adelaide Consultative Forum. She is a lecturer on access to digital content for the University of South Australia's Information Management Programme. Having talked to Jenny already over the weekend, I can definitely say that she's very passionate about digitisation and providing access to digital content online and an avid user of social media like Mark. So between the two of them, I think we will be well represented online over the week. So I'd like to introduce Jenny to you now. Thank you so much. And this is a dream. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, here's Mark on Twitter. <laughs> a couple of minutes ago, talking about um, how art is treating so that's Mark from the National Library of New Zealand at Public Conference in Honiara, and I have hashtagged it archive specific um, and used the National Library of New Zealand um, Twitter tag. Um, so everyone at the National Library of New Zealand will know you've been here and know you've been working. There's the evidence. I do have a couple of little things I've got to say that I promised I would do. I had an email last night and just find it. Can, can you hear me? That's the other thing. I will mumble. So just tell me to speak up and I will, I will do my best. Otherwise I'll grab a mic. Is that better? I project? Yes, I'll try and project. Um, um, many of you know Dr. Terry Brown, um, ex-Bishop of Malaita, um, he's been here in the Solomon Islands many, many, many years. He helped me a lot with my research um, from his archives and Terry, I got an email from him last night saying, Dear Jenny, I'm glad to hear this is all working out well. Please pass on my regards to friends at the National Archives of Solomon Islands and Pacific Manuscript Bureau representatives. Travel well and warm wishes, Terry. So, I thought you'd like to hear from them. But, to get on with the work, um, just let me make sure, oops. The original title of my presentation was Collection and Digitization of Public Access, but we've got 40 minutes, so I hope you don't mind if I leave Collection Digitization and talk about my real passion, which is access. Um, that's me. I'm happy to hear from anyone. Email, Twitter. Um, on Flickr, um, and that's where I come from. That's um, my home in Adelaide, and that's our state library there. There's the three, three buildings, the two heritage buildings, and the central one we opened about 10 years ago. I should also probably make the point that I'm very appreciative of the fact that my employer paid all my costs to come here. I wasn't imagining it that way, but the State Library of South Australia um, jumped on board, thought it was fantastic that um, I wanted to come to Solomon Islands and talk to you about um, some of the projects that I've been involved in, and um, they have funded my trip. So I want to start with this statement, because this really got me. This is from Daniel Kay, working for the Lowy Institute in Australia, who many of you may know about. And her statement was, the Pacific Islands region is in the midst of an information and communications technology revolution that could have major implications, particularly for democratic governance and the region's development. In urban and increasingly in rural settings, Pacific Islanders are using new digital tools to communicate form online networks and coordinate. And I thought, this is fabulous. So I've got a few of these other quotes, just to give some context. This is from Suva, Island Business. Um, Nothing has revolutionized communication in the developing world as the advent and proliferation of mobile phones. And nothing in the history of the recent Pacific Islands has caught on so fast and had such a profound impact on people's lives. 
The wireless technology of mobile phones has helped countries leapfrog ahead at an incredible pace when compared to the decades it took for fixed line telephony to spread. Especially to the more remote areas, even in the developed world. Contrast that with walking into a mobile retail outlet in Honiara, Suba, Apia, or anywhere in the Pacific Island, picking up the phone. Oh, I'll swivel that out. You can turn that off. Sabotage. Yes. Good. Is it working? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, with a phone that can not only put you in touch with anyone anywhere instantly, but also give you the power to communicate in a variety of modes, text, graphics, email, and accessing the internet. This is the mobile technology that is revolutionizing. Another quote, Honey Aris Online's global UK-based telecommunication sharp Vodafone will inch closer to its market ambitions in the mother load of the Pacific mobile and data market that the historic deal is set to take place in Port Moresby today. That's back in April. In June, a new and exciting information communication technology networking project for the government was launched in Coronara Wednesday. So all these, you know, this took me about half an hour to find all these examples of stuff happening across the Pacific. Minister for Education, Son Ryan's Minister for Education and Human Resource Development, says the new Education Act will bring bigger hopes to the country. It will fully define what the future education system would look like. We need to recognise that new technology and new research on education will require new approaches. We need graduates who can participate in a globalising world. And how can they do this? This is becoming so much easier. So what I saw is the challenge. How can Pacific Island Archives meet the opportunities presented by this ICT revolution? And there's another quote here from Danielle. Approximately 60% of Pacific Islanders now have access to mobile phone. And this figure continues to climb. Mobile internet is leapfrogging obvious barriers to internet access, such as geographical remoteness, financial cost, and availability. A boom in mobile phone use has facilitated the rise of social media in the Pacific. <coughs> this is just some, some stats of, of mobile cell phone um, subscriptions per 100 inhabitants in the Solomon Islands. As you can see, from 1.27 per 100 to now um, better than, what, than 1 in 2. And you can imagine that's just going to keep growing. So we all, but particularly students, and your students, the students across the Pacific, are expecting to access information where we are, not necessarily at home or at school or at the local library, but here. You know, we sit in conferences or they, they sit in the schoolyard or anywhere, and they, there's information that with the technology they can access wherever they are. But is the perception of 24-7 access to information the product of archivists' own publicity? There's a very good quote that's slightly out of date, but now from the archivist of the United States, David Ferreira. And he said in 2010, I think the Electronic Records Archive is probably the biggest, most complex, visible, and important project that we need to get running. Citizens will be able to, from their home, but now from anywhere, at any time of the day or night, access the records of government. So 10 years ago, the State Library of South Australia spent considerable time and money developing what is called its thematic essay memory website to provide access to and interpretation of selected items from its collections. So this was just a traditional website that was really quite good for its time, and we certainly put an awful lot of time into it. But 10 years ago, there was no Facebook, there was no Twitter, there was no Flickr, there was no Pinterest, there was no Instagram, or any of the other social media networks that exist today. And if you go onto Wikipedia, they list, and I'm sure it's not an exhaustive list, of the social media networks that, it, that are out there. And there's hundreds. 10 years ago, no such thing. 
And then in February 2004, Facebook was founded. And the way the world communicates began to change dramatically. We learnt the lesson that the world of available information was so vast and growing at such a rate, people were not going to come to us. We were going to have to go to them, meet them where they already were and where they already were, particularly young people. Um, but increasingly, lots and lots of grandmothers are on Facebook because they can keep track of their grandchildren and that. Um, go to them in the world of social media. Social media created easily accessed platforms that are free or of low cost to provide access to archival collections. So here's something that's already there. You're going to be able to access for free. And then in 2007, the iPhone was launched, bringing mobile access to the internet, social media, and archival collections. So back in 2009, I presented a paper at the ASA Arons Public Joint Conference in Brisbane, Voyaging Together. And that paper was titled, Using Flickr to Provide Access to Private and Public Collections. I actually started to feel that maybe I should be an agent for Flickr, but they haven't paid me a cent yet. But <laughs> so it was time. Um, that paper described my experience of using Flickr to provide access to my private collection of World War II photographs saved by my late father when he was closing the New Zealand base at Hilabo in the central province across Pine Bottom South on Pamiara. And I grew up with these stories. That's why so much of so long wanted to come to the Solomon Islands. So this is a multiple reason trip for me. <laughs> it just gave me the perfect excuse. <laughs> This is the technology that I used to create my digitization program. It's a laptop computer and a scanner and internet access. But it's not exactly high tech. Right? And I also used the media. Just, I got this headline from the Dominion Post as a result of a three line email to them one night thinking, why don't I just email them and see if anybody in New Zealand might be interested in my, my online archive. They did that and I think my hits on my Flickr site went from about a couple of hundred a day to 15,000 overnight. Effective use of media, of traditional media, in combination with new media. All sorts of other people picked up the story once they ran with it. Solomon Star, the ABC, Waikato Times. So it ran all around the Pacific. So building on that experience, have a good time. Building on that experience and those of our national international colleagues, we at the State Library of South Australia now employ a range of social media platforms to provide access to and to publicise our collections. It's not replacing our traditional websites and catalogue access. Uh, that, that's sort of the foundation of our information provision. Uh, but taking selected content from those traditional means of providing access and taking it to where our customers already are. So this is a traditional um, page from our website. It's the way we have traditionally provided access um, from our catalogue. And that same image, put it up. This is it on Flickr. What we tend to do is our selected images on Flickr and on social media are also at much higher resolution. So they're generally ones, no copyright restrictions, we place Creative Commons licenses on them, so we invite people to come to social media, download these photographs, use them for their own purposes, however they like. We just like acknowledgement that originally it did come from us. Why this duplication of access points? We exist as an institution to collect, preserve and provide access to our collections. If our customers, wherever in the world they are, cannot easily find what they are looking for in our collection, they will go elsewhere quite often. There's another example somewhere else, other than the National Library of Australia or the National Library of New Zealand or the Library of Congress. So they'll go somewhere else. But the thing is, with 
things like social media, particularly Flickr, is it's Google searching. So it's a fairly specific search, but just putting in King William Street, Adelaide 1919, our Flickr photo comes up first in the world. So if somebody's just Googling it, and they're not going to come to our website, then we'll go to State Library's website. They go into Google, they will put their search term into Google. If they're doing that, we want them coming to our Flickr site, not someone else's Flickr site. Because if they come to our Flickr site, they will use our collection, and that is our reason to be. So what is Flickr? Basically, it's an online photo management and sharing application. That's their description of it. And lots of people use Flickr. There's the Museum of Samoa, National Archives of Australia, Archives of New Zealand, Library of Congress, Regional Assistance Mission at Solomon Islands, Ramsey. They're there on Flickr. So why are they using Flickr? Mm -hmm. Flickr, now, just in the last couple of months, they will provide you with a terabyte of free space or nothing. All you actually have to do is register. You can get unlimited space and to do whatever you like for, the, for what is $25 American per annum subscription. So if you pay a subscription, and if you've got $25 American, um, that's really cheap web access. And you can load as much digital content as you like, as you've got, into something like Flickr um, for that. It's, it's a, I think what I've always looked for is cheap, low technology access to archives that is going to have a huge spread across the world. Because if you've got a student in Paris who's doing a a project on Tonga, you want them coming to your content to use your content. You don't want them going to the Library of Congress to use the Library of Congress content. Yours is better. Now then, this is by way of a little bit of an apology. This is the National Archives UK's Flickr website. And I don't really intend to be hypercritical of them, but in fact I'm rather thankful that they've given me a wonderful example of how not to do flip. This is a photograph that I came across from their website, their Flickr site. Um, and I've got this ongoing interest in all things to do with New Zealand flying boats. So mm -hmm. this is an RNZAF um, Sunderland flying boat. And their description photo. Sir Ronald, back to camera, about to go aboard the RNZ Air flying boat to return to Fiji after signing the treaty. Sir Ronald who? Um, flying boat, what sort of flying boat? Um, the treaty. What treaty? Location time. Okay. And the metadata says taken on November 15th, 2012. Well, we know that that was not taken on November the 15th, 2012. So there's, there's, they've uploaded a really interesting photograph. But their description, their metadata is deplorable. I'm sorry. For someone who loves metadata, who has learned to love metadata in the last... If you're going to spend the time putting content online, make it discoverable because and make it usable by good description, good metadata. And the other thing is, this is quite, you can't see it there, this is quite a small digital image, it's not big. It's only 714 by about 516 pixels. So it's not, not a big image. These days you can do a lot better than that. Yes, there it is, 714 by 566 pixels. Now, just as a little aside, to give you some idea of what Flickr is. Yes. Flickr is structured and you have your photo stream. Your photo stream is just the photographs and all, all the digital images, because it doesn't have to be photographs, it can be document, doc, digitized documents. 
as you blow them. But then you can put them aside in sets. So you can say, okay, I've got a stream of photographs. Some of them are of Tonga, some of them are Samoa, some of them are Vanuatu. And you can create sets and put them into those sets so you can organize them. But then there's also groups. And, you, and groups, anyone can set up a group. You can set up a group on Flickr and call it um, Solomon Islands or Papua New Guinea, whatever. And invite, you can add your content into that and invite other people to add their content into that as well. And you can control what that content is if you're the person who created it. <coughs> so going back to the of Tonga and, and, the, and the photo, this is, this is the National Archives UK Tonga set. Um, and the original photograph of the flying boat belonged in this set. And here's another one, a fabulous photograph. Described as I have a bunch of description here. Oops, can I go back? This one, I'm sorry, I, I get angry about descriptions. So. <laughs> There's a certain colonial, dare I say, um, maybe this was the original description of the way of the photograph. So I'll forgive them that. But it says, happy Tongan girls who served the guests at the feast. Actually, if you look closely at it, most of them are quite definitely women. Um, they, they don't look particularly young. And what feast? What feast? I, I ask. And once again, taken in 2012. So it's 702 by 560 pixels. And so you can't see the faces properly. If they digitized them to a proper size, we'd be able to see the individuals and identify them. Because, although the, this photo in reality was taken in 1958, um, it took me a long time to work this out. Yeah. Um, so a lot of these these women, uh, you know, they, they've got they've got children and grandchildren and possibly great grandchildren who would perhaps love a copy of this photograph for themselves. Um, but it's not big enough. To, to really properly identify. Sorry? Here's another one from the same set. A Tongan girl dancer who took part in the entertainment. What well, entertainment? More dancers. That's not enough description to me. It's not enough description if you want to use it, and it's not enough description to find it in the first place. Unless you're just web browsing and you haven't come across it. If you're Google searching, this is not this is not going to be found. And once again, taken on November 15, 2012. They weren't, they were taken in 1958. You actually have to get to the bottom, you have to flip through two pages in their set to find that some of the original photographs actually had text attached that tells you what the event was and when they were taken. But when, you're, when you're describing a photograph or a document on social media or on the internet, you don't assume that somebody's found the first image. You have to assume that they've come to this image and the description needs, to, all the description needs to be there on that image. And they've made that mistake. So thank you, because they've given me this wonderful example. So here it is. Um, the plan of potentiaries of the United Kingdom, Sir Ronald Garvey, we now know who Sir Ronald was. He was Sir Ronald Garvey. And of the United King, Kingdom of Tonga, His Royal Highness, the Crown Prince to Portland, Tungi Kegye, sign of trip signed the Treaty of Friendship in the Legislative Assembly Building, 26th of August, 1958. 
they had the information there. It's not a big secret. They could have transferred that metadata into Flickr. So what I did is I acquired their photograph. They said that I could. And I added it to my own Flickr site. And I put in the description that I wanted to put in. And this is what I came up with as, 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 as an alternative to school. So Ronald Garvey, KCMG, KCDO, MBE. There is a link in that to this Wikipedia description. Governor of Fiji, back to camera, prepares to board a Royal New Zealand Air Force short Sunderland MR5 flying boat before returning to Fiji from Nukuloka, Tonga, after signing the Treaty of Friendship between the United Kingdom and the Kingdom of Tonga, 26th of August 1958. And I put the source in with a link to the source, National Archives UK. Um, by the time I did this, this photograph had already had 88 views on Flickr. I think I was beating the UK's rate of description. Um, you probably can't see it there, but I also tagged it. You can put in tags. So I would have tagged it with with Tonga and with Treaty of Friendship and with Garvey and those sorts of things. So anybody doing a Google search, find it. And this morning, just by chance, I thought I'd test it. I did a search on, my search term was on Google 1958 Tonga Garvey Treaty. This photo came up number one, just by that across everything else that was on the internet, anywhere in the world, this photo came up number one by putting those four search terms. Okay, Archives New Zealand. This is a lovely photograph of Archives New Zealand. The thing about it, it's got good description, Pitifully, they still say it was taken in 2013, which is actually their digitization date. We don't really want to know the digitization date. And when you go into the metadata of these photographs, there is a date of upload, which will give you very close. But you can also change that date. But it's a very good size. It's... It's 4,197 by 3,411 pixels. You can get the detail of the people's faces. So people can download it, people can see who's actually in it. So if, if you, were, you were there, you, can, you know, if these are your relatives, these are your family, you can actually download a real photograph of your family members and use it. It's well out of copyright. So this is about sharing our archives. This is one of my photos. Um, Islanders on Sekyanma. Have I got that pronunciation right? I don't know. Tell me, if, tell me if my pronunciation's wrong, I'm sorry. Um, now this photo though, it's only 2,400 by 1,639 pixels. But this was a photograph I acquired from a, a ex-New Zealand airman who was here in the Pacific in World War II. And I'll show you the technology that we used. Camera. Photo album. The floor of his lounge room. Turn the camera on. photograph it and take it home and upload it with a little bit of cropping. Now this sort of photograph, so that's about as low tech as it can get. 